The first human species evolved roughly 2 million years ago. Over the next 1.9 million years, more than a dozen human species would evolve. They differed in the sizes of their brain, just how upright they were, their diets, the shapes of their teeth, and much else. But one thing that united all of these human species was that they were, as far as we can understand, all rare. None of these species is likely to have numbered more than 50,000 or so individuals. That's to say that from the perspective of our modern lives, all of those humans constituted something like a medium-sized town. Roughly 100,000 years ago, however, one human species, Homo sapiens, our species, began to become slightly more common. These humans began to become more common and also to spread to more places around the world. They went to colder places, to warmer places, to drier places, even to wetter places. And as they did, their collective population swelled to hundreds of thousands. Eventually, in some places, populations of humans were sufficiently dense that they could no longer survive by gathering and hunting alone. In that context, they began to farm. Relative to the long history of human species, the origin of farming is a very recent occurrence. It occurred roughly 700 generations ago. If you lined up 700 people and had them all hold hands, that's not a very long line. And so think about that, going back in time, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on, going back not very far. By the time the first humans began to farm, they'd already been altering their environments in other ways. They'd begun, for example, fermenting some foods. People in the Fertile Crescent were making beer. People in parts of what is now China were making a kind of rice wine. It's been argued that it was these kinds of fermentations that helped to set the stage for the origins of agriculture. Some people came to enjoy beers and wine so much that they may have needed to farm in order to make more beer and wine. In order, in other words, to have grains, to feed the microbes, to make the beer and the wine. This for sure is part of the story. How much of the story it is, we're not yet sure. However it happened though, the birth of agriculture as we now understand it was not a very noble moment. Once crops began to be domesticated, populations began to increase more. The increases came with new challenges. As settlements became bigger, nutrition declined, income inequality also emerged and increased. For the first time in the history of the human species, there would have been haves and have-nots. And there was something else. Humans began to suffer from the consequences of their own actions. Water systems became polluted. Fecal oral pathogens became more abundant. Yet even as these settlements were becoming bigger and the stories of kings and queens of yore were unfolding, the global population of humans was still relatively small. By 6,000 years ago, when cities were becoming larger and larger, the total population of humans was around 10 million. That's smaller than some modern cities. And those 10 million people were scattered across the continents. Earth was still a place in which many wild vertebrate animal species were more numerous than were humans. Reindeer, for example, were far more common than people. But the populations of humans were beginning to increase more rapidly. By the year zero, there were around 300 million people on Earth, roughly the modern population of the United States distributed across all of the continents. By the time my grandfather was born, there were about 1.7 billion people on Earth. By the time my father was born, the population on Earth was around 2.3 billion. By the time I was born, there were 4 billion people on Earth. By the time most of you were born, there were 6.3 billion people on Earth. Today, there are 7.9 billion people on Earth. This growth of human populations has been described as the Great Acceleration. The population growth rates of humans accelerated in the way that bacteria population growth accelerates in a petri dish. So too all the consequences of human populations. The number of chairs produced by humans increased. The number of homes, of roads, of pencils, and wheels of cheese. The number of everything that humans make increased. The numbers of everything that humans consumed decreased. Once there were more reindeer than humans, now there are not only many thousandfold more humans than reindeer, 
There are more cats than reindeer, more dogs than reindeer, more cows than reindeer, more pigs than reindeer, more chickens than reindeer, and so on. There are even today more laboratory rats than there are reindeer. There are many ways to think about the great acceleration. One way is in terms of the waste that human populations created. As human populations increased in number, so too did the amount of waste produced. Humans produced ever more garbage, more food waste, and more feces, extraordinary quantities of feces. They also produced more waste associated with the burning of fossil fuels, waste in the form of carbon dioxide and methane. The waste has actually increased in quantity faster than the rate at which human populations have increased. This is because people have, in general, and especially in the United States, consumed ever more food and ever more material goods per person than ever before. And so too, they've produced ever more waste per person. Here are concrete examples useful. Today, the average American consumes roughly 40 times as many resources and produces even more times as much waste as our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have. And so there are more of us and each of our impacts is greater. At some point, all of these changes associated with the great acceleration were so sweeping, so comprehensive, so extensive across continents and forests and rivers and oceans that geologists came to recognize that we were in the midst of a new geological era of our own making, a geological era that's come to be called the Anthropocene, the human era. And geologists debate just when this era begins. Should it begin with agriculture? Should it begin with the Industrial Revolution? What they don't debate is that we are flung at this point, at this moment today, headlong into this era. Interestingly, from the perspective of evolutionary biologists, from the perspective of biologists more generally, what's happened with the human populations is not totally without precedent. Other species have undergone similar sweeping increases in abundance, their own great accelerations. For example, when the first green species, the first photosynthetic sun harvesting organisms began to be able to live by the sun and by fixing carbon dioxide and using the energy of the sun, they too produced huge amounts of waste. Their waste was in the form of oxygen. This was unfortunate because oxygen was toxic to these same species. It threatened their existence, as well as much of the rest of life. These species survived the consequences of their own great acceleration by evolving. Lineages that couldn't cope when extinct, those with the genes that allowed them to persist, including our own ancestors, survived. It was a time of great change. It was a horrible time for most species. Superficially, the great acceleration of the first green photosynthetic life forms might seem to offer us a lesson. But if it does, it's a grim one, a story of disaster followed by slow evolutionary change. It's not the example we want to follow. But here, there's good news, very good news. For non-human species, coping with change often means evolving, moving or evolving. Some of individuals with the right genes survive, most don't, and there's no good way to share those genes. But as humans, our possibilities are more ample. We can survive by thinking our way out of problems. We can survive by virtue of novel ideas rather than novel genes. And what's more, we can share ideas. Those with good ideas have the potential to benefit not only their own family, state, or country, but the rest of the world. This is our great hope, but there's also a little more. I walked you through the great acceleration in human population. Most of what increased during this acceleration was bad. More waste, more overuse of resources, but it wasn't all bad. The number of human ideas also increases with the number of humans. Our human population, as a result, has the greatest potential for new ideas, for innovation that it has ever had. What's more, in a time in which we are connected more than we've ever been, those ideas can be shared rapidly. Here then is the take home. We find ourselves in a moment in which humans control most of Earth's resources and are producing wastes of various sorts that threaten both other species of life on Earth, but also threaten our own species. But we find ourselves also in a moment in which our potential to come up with novel ideas is greater than it's ever been. We can be the agents of positive radical change. It starts, however, with understanding the situation and solutions at hand. 
It starts with knowing what needs to be solved in the first place and knowing too what solutions already exist. And there's one more thing. The ideas that will solve the problems at hand will not be individual. This is not the story of the lone genius. It can't be. If we imagine that we can solve these problems alone, we will fail. Ours needs to be a story of writers working with engineers, working with biologists, working with artists, working with architects. Our success or failure, and there will be both, will be as a function of our ability to link our ideas together across disciplines in order to achieve what we couldn't do individually. And so it's with this context that we begin the Wicked Problems course. It is a course that gives you a window into our population, our community of people, ideas, and connections. In our community, we connect ideas across disciplines. We turn those connected ideas into solutions that are then shared around the world. With you here at NC State, we have the potential to create ever more radical innovations, innovations that transform how we live with each other and with the rest of life. As you participate in the next weeks of the course, it's your turn to help think about ideas. What are your ideas for ways to design cities, new ways to conserve wildlife, new ways to talk about and imagine our stories? What are your ideas about connecting insights from one discipline to another? What are your ideas about redefining how we live? These are not rhetorical questions. At NC State, most of our greatest ideas and innovations come from our students. They come from people like you working with faculty and other scholars. So listen during this course, but also begin to take notes, begin to talk to other students, begin to share your ideas. The greatest thing about a university is a microcosm of the greatest thing about humanity. It is the potential for many people together to do what none could do on their own.